How do you put a giraffe in the fridge? This question sounds like a cliche brain teaser, but it is actually very relevant with our topic today. It's surprising, right? Keep watching, and you will find out what this seemingly dumb brain teaser has to do with recursion. In the previous video, we introduced the reverse thinking in recursion and summarized the general process of defining recursive functions. However, we often find it very tricky when actually writing recursive functions. This is because the recursive function is always calling itself, and the recursive calls are nested with each other. We can be easily confused by this nesting relationship. Welcome to CS with Terry. In this video, we'll discuss how to treat recursion sickness. Let's review merge sort one more time. This is the pseudocode of merge sort. We can summarize it into four steps: function definition, base case processing, recursive call, and constructing the final result. In the function definition step, we define the function merge sort, hoping that it can sort the elements in the L to R minus one closed interval in A. In the base case processing step, if the number of elements to be sorted is less than or equal to one, return directly. In the recursive call step, the array A is split into two subarrays, and they are sorted separately. In the constructing final result step, we merge two sorted subarrays into one sorted array. When sorting the original array, we need to call the merge sort function and pass the array A. The left boundary zero and the right boundary, which happens to equal the length of A as parameters. Now let's take a closer look at these four steps. First, in the function definition step, we need to be clear what kind of task the recursive function should accomplish. We can see the functions defined here are called in two places to solve the original problem and the subproblem. Therefore, before defining the recursive function, we should first identify what the original problem and subproblem are. How to define this recursive function in a way such that it can be called both by the original problem and the subproblem? In merge sort, the original problem is to sort the entire array, and the subproblem is to sort a subarray. Therefore, when defining the recursive function, we need to pass in the two indices L and R. This way, the function can be conveniently called by both the original and the subproblem. Next, we deal with the base case. Which is the basis of recursion. In this step, the function hard codes the correct answer when the data size is small enough, and returns directly. The next two operations are recursive call and constructing the final result. We call the recursive call a super operation, and the constructing final result a micro operation. Why do we call recursive calls super operations? We know that the recursive call here solves the super problem. Which is to sort the left and right subarrays respectively. However, sorting them is not a one-step operation. It involves further calls to the recursive function, just like this. Therefore, we call the recursive call step a super operation. Why do we call the constructing final result step a micro operation? Here, this step calls the merge function, which merges two sorted arrays into one sorted array. We can see that the merge function does not involve complex recursions, but only completes a simple task. So we call it a micro operation. Well, let's answer the question: Why do designing recursive functions sometimes make our head spin? It's because of the super operations. We can see that the purpose of the super operation here is to sort the left and right subarrays. Since there are many nested operations within, we may doubt whether this super operation can complete its task, or whether the nested logic will go wrong. With this skepticism, we may try to explore the internal logic of super operations and think about the next level of recursion, which means continue to split and sort subarrays. If we keep doing this and try to untangle the nested logic. We may feel that recursive design becomes more and more difficult, and get more and more confused. Have you experienced this kind of confusion? So how do we avoid this trap? It is in fact quite simple. We need to think of the super operation as a whole, or as an atomic operation. In other words, we need to ignore all the details in the super operation, as long as we know what it can accomplish as a whole and have faith it can finish its task. This is called a leap of faith. By treating the super operation as a single step, 
we no longer care about its internal logic, but just assume it is correct. This is how we can cure recursion sickness. With this way of thinking, the pseudocode becomes very simple. We perform a super operation to sort the left and right subarrays, and trust that it can do it. Then we merge the sorted left and right subarrays to get the sorted original array. With the merge sort example, we can see that the key to treating recursion sickness is don't delve into the internal logic of the super operation of recursion, but just have faith that it can complete its mission. Now let's answer the question: How do you put a giraffe into a fridge? Well, there are three steps. Step one: Open the fridge door. Step two. Put the giraffe in. Step three: Close the fridge door. Here, putting the giraffe in the fridge is a super operation, while opening and closing the fridge door are micro operations. Instead of worrying about the details of the super operation, putting the giraffe in, let's just be steadfast in our belief that it can be done. You may ask, why do we believe that super operation will be able to complete its task? Aren't we worried that something will go wrong somewhere? To answer this question, we need to understand the similarities between recursion and mathematical induction. Mathematical induction includes three steps: base case, induction hypothesis, and induction. For example, for the base case, we need to prove that a certain proposition holds when n is equal to one. Then, for the induction hypothesis, we assume that this proposition is also true when n is equal to k. Finally, in the induction step, we need to prove from the induction hypothesis that this proposition is also true when n is equal to k plus one. If these three steps are satisfied, we can prove that this proposition is true for any positive integer. Just like dominoes, if the first domino falls, the other dominoes will follow. Carefully observe the three steps of mathematical induction. We'll find that it aligns with the three steps in the recursion. The base case in mathematical induction corresponds to the base case processing. They both deal with the problem with small data size. Induction hypothesis corresponds to recursive calls. They both assume that the subproblems of the original problem can be solved correctly. Induction corresponds to constructing the final result. They both derive the solution to the larger original problem from the solution to the subproblems. To answer the question we just asked. Why are we so sure that the recursion can accomplish its task? The answer is that as long as the base case is correct, if we assume that the recursive call is also correct, and if we handle the constructing final result step correctly, the entire recursion must be correct. Take merge sort as an example. In the base case, the length of the array is one, and it is inherently ordered. We keep recursing and assume we can get two ordered subarrays and merge them correctly in each recursion step. Then the original array will be sorted. This is a testament that as long as we handle the base case and the final result construction correctly, we can definitely get a recursive program that works. Next, let's take a look at a classic recursion problem, the Tower of Hanoi. In this problem, there are three pegs A, B, and C. There are n disks on peg A, and the size of the disks increases from top to bottom. Our goal is to move these n disks to peg C, just like this. There are two restrictions: one, we can only move one disk at a time, not multiple ones simultaneously. Two, after moving the disk, a larger disk cannot be placed on top of a smaller one. Let's look at a few simple cases first. When there is only one disk, we can simply move it to C. When there are two disks, we need to move the smaller disk to B first, then move the larger disk to C, and finally move the smaller disk from B to C. When there are three disks, the problem becomes a bit harder, but it's not difficult to find through simple trial and error that we can solve it this way. Carefully analyzing the moves of the three disks, we can find that it requires a total of seven steps. And these seven steps can be divided into three groups. First, move the smaller two disks from A to B. Then, move the largest disk from A to C. Finally, move the smaller two disks from B to C. Remember, we just talked about moving two disks from A to C. 
while here we are moving two disks from A to B and from B to C. There is no material difference, only the start and destination pegs are different. Therefore, we can call the moving of two disks a subproblem of moving three disks. Equivalently, we can understand the three groups of operation as a combination of super operation plus micro operation plus super operation. In other words, move two disks from A to B with super operation. Move the largest disk from A to C with micro operation. Move two disks from B to C with super operation. This solves the Tower of Hanoi problem with three disks. By analogy, we can find that we can use this combination of super operation plus micro operation plus super operation to solve Tower of Hanoi no matter how many disks there are. For example, if there are 10 disks, we can move the top 9 disks from A to B with super operation. Then move the largest disk from A to C with micro operation. And finally, move the 9 disks from B to C with super operation. Let's implement the pseudocode of the Tower of Hanoi. First, we define the Hanoi function and pass in 4 parameters, which are the number of disks n, the source peg, the target peg, and the auxiliary peg. We want this function to move n disks from source to target, and use auxiliary as a transition. Note that the three parameters source, target, and auxiliary do not necessarily correspond to the three fixed pegs one by one, but can be arranged arbitrarily. In other words, the n disks can be moved from any peg to any other one. Then, we define the base case. When n is equal to 1, move the disk from source to target and return. Next, we call the recursive function to temporarily move the top n-1 disks from source to auxiliary. This is the super operation. Let's ignore its inner details for the time being, but assume that it can be done. At this point, only the largest disk is left on the source, and we move it to the target. This is the micro operation. Finally, we call the recursive function again to perform a super operation and move the n-1 disks from auxiliary to target. If you see this code for the first time, you may be puzzled that the seemingly complicated Tower of Hanoi problem can be solved with so few lines of code. Can this code really handle everything? Will there be errors? As we just introduced, the best way to cure your recursion sickness is not to dwell into the internal details of the super operation, but just have faith that it can complete its task. Then, we only need to deal with the base case and the construction of the final result. Does the problem become simpler when approached this way? Let us know in the comments section. Let's analyze the recursion tree for the 3 disk Tower of Hanoi problem to further demonstrate the correctness of this code. To move the 3 disk Tower of Hanoi, we split our moves into a combination of super operation plus micro operation plus super operation. Both of these two super operations need to move two disks of the tower, so further recursion is required. In other words, they can also be divided into a combination of super operation plus micro operation plus super operation. Then, these super operations only need to move one disk, which becomes the base case, so they can be directly processed. Let's simulate a recursive execution. At this point, the simulation has been completed, and the three disks have been successfully moved to the target. Interestingly, we can find that the operations that actually move the disks are micro operations and base case processing. The super operations themselves do not move the disk. They just organize each micro operation and base case processing together. Here is a summary of the steps to design recursive functions. Generally speaking, as long as you can sort out these four steps, 
you should be able to write correct recursive functions. Before you go, here is a question for you to think about. We just explained how to solve the Tower of Hanoi problem recursively, but how do we analyze its time complexity? We'll talk about it in the next video. That's all for today. If you like our videos, please hit the like button, subscribe to our channel, and share it with your friends. If you have any questions or suggestions, please leave a comment. See you next time.